Good morning. Our next plenary session is on innovation, innovative governance models, a quest for the common good. To chair this discussion, we have the head editor of City Lab, Nicole Flatto. She'll be joined by the following speakers. The Ministry of Spatial Planning and Housing in Angola, Anna Paula Chantreluna de Cavallo. Also, we have the former Executive Director of UN Habitat, Joanne Kloss. We also have the President Leonardo Analytics and Industries from SAP, Marla Anand. We also have the Director General of Information Information Research Department and Secretary General of China Smarter City Development, Ziang Shan. And finally, we also have the Di Diversification and Strategic Projects Director, Alfonso Diaz Del Rio. Please welcome them to the stage. Good morning. I'm Nicole Flato. Uh, I'll be moderating this panel. I'm the editor of City Lab, and for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're a US based. We're at citylab.com. We're a news and analysis site about cities, so urban policy and ideas. We're a sister site of the Atlantic, um, so please check us out. I couldn't be more thrilled to be here with these esteemed folks. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about innovation and the common good. Uh, so this notion that innovation should be bottom up and serve the interests of all of the people in any given place or uh, jurisdiction and not just a few, I'm going to introduce you to our guests. So all the way on the left over here, we have Alfonso Diaz del Rio Diaz del Bustamante. He is the uh, Diversification and Tr Strategic Projects Director for Ferrovial. Uh, next, we have Ana Paula Chantre Luna de Carvalho. She is the uh, Ministry of Spatial Planning, uh, Territorial, and Housing for Angola. Next, we have Ms. Mala Anand. She is the President for Leonardo Analytics and Industry for SAP. Over here, we have Mr. Jingzhuang Shan, who is the uh, State Information Center Director General uh, of the Information Research Department, as well as the Secretary General of China Smart City Development based in Beijing. Uh, he oversees operations for all of China, however. And right here, we have Mr. Zhuang Klaus, who is um, former executive director of UN Habitat, as well as a former mayor of the fine city we're in right now. Barcelona. Uh, so really pleased to have you all with us. To get started, I'm going to ask you all a general question. Uh, so smart city innovations have the potential to transform society for better, but the peril that comes along with it so often uh, is that they'll serve some people and not others. So one of the things we want to talk about today is how you make innovation serve the common good. What are your philosophies or um, vision of how you approach incorporating the public good into your work? Uh, well, we'll start with uh, Anna over here. Okay, muito. Yo hablaré portuñol, que es la mistura entre portugués y español. Eh, yo vengo de Angola. Angola es un, un país de continente africano. Como saben, he vivido un largo periodo de guerra civil. Y en 2002, con el alcance de la paz, no, el gobierno ha realizado un programa voltado para el ordenamiento del territorio, un programa nacional del urbanismo y habitación. Eh, con este programa 
conseguiu-se realizar programas novos habitacionais, ou seja, eh, se conseguiu realizar um programa de casas públicas que primeiramente seriam para a camada mais baixa, mas mesmo a camada média não tinha acesso à habitação, porque a habitação existente era a habitação colonial ainda, que era muito, muito, muito pouca, porque toda a atenção foi dada à, à, à guerra. É, com esse programa, conseguiu-se fazer mais, mais ou menos 200 mil habitações em todo o país, é, nas principais capitais, com planos de urbanização. E nos municípios, que são 164, gizou-se em 130 um programa de 200 casas para cada um desses municípios. É, para além disso, foi-se fazendo, fazendo loteamentos para a autoconstrução dirigida. Posto isso, Começamos a trabalhar em planos de ordenamento de território. Mas dos 164 municípios, não lo temos todos até o momento. Temos uma boa parte já hecha, mas foram criados alguns planos urbanos. Isso para chegar ao aspecto de cidades inteligentes. Nós sabemos que estamos muito distantes, mas queremos lá chegar. É... Em relação à mobilidade, é muito deficiente. Muito deficiente porque 25 milhões de habitantes é mais ou menos a população desde o último censo. Mais 30% vivem em Luanda, capital, que é a província mais pequena. Então, principalmente em Luanda, o aspecto mobilidade é muito difícil. É, há transportes públicos, é, mas também ainda há uma deficiência, porque sabemos que para caminhar para aquilo que são as cidades inteligentes, além da organização do ordenamento do território, há necessidade de termos uma boa mobilidade e também o acesso à internet para todos. Esse acesso também tem sido trabalhado em algumas zonas, principalmente nas capitais, já han tido esse acesso à internet, mas ainda não é um acesso a todos. É, dizer que para Luanda, que é o, o, a província que lhe concentra 30% ou mais da população, já foi feito um plano urbano, um plano provincial, um instrumento de, de ordenamento de território para a população, que, que, se, que, que se prevê muito aquilo que é o aspecto mobilidade, o que era da resposta a isso. De uma forma geral, depois poder falar os demais. Muito obrigada. Obrigada. Thank you so much. Alfonso. Bueno, no sabía que se podía hablar en español, así que me la he preparado en inglés. I'm going to do it in English. Yes, in English. Uh, yes, sorry. go ahead. Uh, that's right. But well, thanks everybody. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, thanks my colleagues here. And thanks for the such a nice uh, title for the session, no? A Quest for the Common Good. I would like to approach it from the context. The context that we live today, that at the end is is a context of a new world, a new world that are the cities. And this new world brings challenges and problems that uh, some of them are known, like the climate change, mobility, aging of the populations, and others that we don't know yet today. But it also implies a new world, implies new cities, new citizens. These new citizens are going to be more informed, they are going to be more proactive, they will be more collaborative, and they are going to be more engaged and they are going to be demanding new solutions that cannot be approached in a traditional way. We need to be uh, disruptive, innovative in the way we, we approach it. How we, how, the way we are tackling this uh, from Ferrovial is in three aspects. No? Uh, 
uh, we are um, basing it on the innovation, the public-private partnership, and understanding the citizen. I'm going to get a little bit on those three. Uh, open innovation, uh, what does it mean for us? It means collaborate with all the stakeholders, uh, citizens, customers, clients, administrations, technological companies, startups, and try to build with them, try to co-create solutions that address uh, problems for the citizens. Then uh, the part of the public-private relationship. No? If you think uh, in Ferrovial, it has been already a while since we have changed the concept. And we are not seeing this relationship as a client provider or provider client. We are looking at it from a partnership perspective. And in this partnership, we look for different things. We look for complementarity. I mean, uh, you may think that Ferrovial is a big company and we do things very well, but that's not true. I mean, there are other things that other people do much better. So we need to uh, exactly let the administration lead what they know and us do what we know. And together, being able to, to add more than two when, when we add both of us. Then we also, uh, now talking about the understanding the citizen. No? It's been, I mean, if you think of Ferrovial 10 years ago, it was a pure B2G company. I mean, we used to work a lot with the administration. Lately, we start adding uh, private clients. And more recently, uh, we are turning it to a B2C company. And now, it's when we are realizing how important is the client, how important is the user, how important is the citizen. Understanding what he needs, how he needs, and when he needs things. And what we are doing is applying all this knowledge that we are gathering with these new initiatives to our traditional uh, public contracts and trying to enhance them and changing them from the traditional B2G to a B2G2C or what we uh, typically call uh, PPPP, no? public-private partnership and people uh, adding into the mix. So just to conclude, uh, I would like to enhance the idea that we are facing new things uh, we have to approach it from a different perspective, both private companies and governments. And I think the both of us have to approach it from innovation, collaboration, co-creation, and understanding the citizen. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks very much. <laughs> Mama, tell us about your vision. Great, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. I'm delighted to be here to talk about this very strategic topic of smart cities. And the, the impact that we're seeing on the seismic shift on, on what the population is going through and what kind of impact is that going to have on health, on education, on safety. So as a result, the ability for cities to partner with businesses and nonprofits to create new forms of business model innovation for the cities. And as a result, the impact that this is going to have on underserved communities in many cases, the impact it will have sustainability targets, the impact of climate change, and very importantly, the ability for cities to be able to partner with transportation, with logistics, with automotives to create safe mobility options. So as a result, being able to solve many of these strategic issues to really uplift and create this next generation of cities that we all dream about. At SAP, we've had more than 46 years of depth from an industry perspective. And as a result, the ability for us to really impact these social communities and create these next generation cities. And as we look around us, there's a fourth generation of industrial revolution. And this is where new forms of systems of intelligence are emerging. What we see in these new forms of systems of intelligence is the ability to embed machine learning, big data, analytics, IoT, into the depth and the breadth of business processes across the city's value chain. And when we do that across a city's ecosystem and value chain, this gives the ability for us to reap unprecedented value from data for a city. It enables us to create new business models and completely reimagine the experiences. And what we see are three very important levers to drive this. The first important lever is the notion of the city's ecosystem. Think about it as a symphonic ecosystem where the city will interact across industries, across transportation, public sector, all elements that drive these citizen services. 
The second very important lever is these digital intelligence solutions, the ability to embed machine learning, big data, analytics, IoT, into the depth and breadth of these business processes that are inherent and drive the nervous system of the city. And the third is when we have this data value chain, the ability for us to create new business model innovations across this data value chain. So when we look at all of these three elements, there's truly a notion of a symphonic ecosystem that is extremely important. And at SAP, we look at this in three important ways of driving impact. The first is the ability, when we have this data value chain across the ecosystem, to translate these insights into true actions. The second is when we have visibility into this data value chain, the ability for us to create very innovative business models across this and drive that uplifting impact. And the third, of course, is when we look at the orchestration across an ecosystem, across an intelligent solution, as well as across this data value chain for business model creation, the ability for us to truly impact and create this next generation of communities, next generation of cities, and very importantly, lead this next generation of economy. Thank you. Mr. Shen. OK. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I come from uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, this morning, I visited my uh, uh, nation's company, Huawei's exhibition desk. Maybe uh, some of you have visited the desk. I think Huawei's uh, platform and their uh, application represents the standards of the what happened in China now, our efforts to build smarter cities. Uh, actually, uh, in 2014, the central government of China uh, set up a national policy uh, to make sure the smart city to be healthy to uh, healthily uh, develop in China. And also, the central government uh, set up a group uh, constructed by 25 uh, central government uh, sectors to guide the local cities uh, for their uh, smart city construction. Uh, Perhaps you don't know, in China, we now have 500 cities, different levels. Uh, they all say they, they are involved in the process of smart city uh, construction. Maybe this is the largest number uh, around the world. Uh, for one country, they have, we have so many cities to involved in the smart city process, and also, uh, many uh, uh, organizations, they say that in China, we have the largest marketplace for smart cities. Uh, some agencies say that maybe uh, uh, in the future, we have uh, thousands of billions of renminbi as a marketplace for the construction of smart cities. So uh, in China, smart city or innovative smart city is a very hot topic. And uh, with uh, uh, cloud computing, with the uh, Internet of Things, uh, with uh, blockchains, and with uh, uh, all the uh, native IoT uh, technologies. And also in, uh, in China, we now, the central government, uh, they, we designed a evaluation system to guide the local cities for their uh, construction of smart cities. And this is a, a very overall evaluation system. Uh, include eight aspects to evaluate different uh, aspects of the smart city, how from the central government's uh, guidelines uh, to guide the local uh, cities for their construction. For example, uh, the public services, uh, the information infrastructure, the information sharing and uh, utilization, uh, the information security, and also for the uh, surroundings and uh, uh, all the uh, good uh, atmosphere uh, for the cities to deal with the big problems of the cities uh, in uh, modernization. So uh, in 
uh, last year, we issued the reports about the evaluation results of the more than uh, 200 cities in China, all about the professional level cities in China. So the total uh, 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 score is 100. And for the 220 cities in China, uh, the average score is 58, 58.03. That means that uh, although uh, we have five, maybe more than 500 uh, cities in China, they are involved in the process of uh, uh, smart city construction, but the phase is initial. And many cities are in the digital phase, not the smart, uh, smart intelligent uh, uh, process of, uh, of the, all the process. So that means many cities, uh, they just start their work and to uh, uh, finish their uh, job of the uh, digitalize uh, for the smart, uh, smart cities uh, 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 efforts. So this is a basic uh, 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 problem in China. So we have to have more uh, efforts to uh, get the, the whole models, how to uh, uh, top, top design the big cities uh, surround all the government, all the infrastructures, and all the people of the, of the cities. So uh, in China, we, uh, I think it's a very big challenge to set up a good model, uh, a successful model for the top level design to integrate the data, to integrate uh, technology and the different demands of all the people around the nation. So I think this is a big problem. Also, uh, we now uh, make many efforts to build up the business model for the smart city. So, uh, because smart city is not the problem of the government, but the society, but the public. So how to keep the uh, information systems can, uh, can run a long time, uh, not depends on the government, not, not depends on the different uh, technologies. So I think uh, this is uh, what we've done in China now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Finally, Mr. Coles. Tell me about your vision yeah. <coughs> for incorporating the company. Thank you very much. i am just been impressed by the Chinese uh, reality. Uh, you mentioned that you have 530 cities uh, in, uh, in, uh, in China. Uh, and I just remember that in, in, in uh, the region of Catalonia, we have 890 municipalities, which uh, every one of them considers uh, a unit of uh, uh, local management. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that the, the interesting question about uh, innovative governance uh, models uh, for the whole world, for Europe, for example, uh, and some parts of, of the uh, uh, America and also uh, other parts of the world, it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a difficult question, because the cities they have changed very much, they are changing very much, but the governance models of the cities are not changing as fast the city is changing faster than the model of governance. Uh, for example, our municipal uh, boundaries in Spain, they have been settled or are arranged in the 18th century, where uh, the population of Spain was one-tenth of the current population. And the population of every one of the municipalities mm -hmm. also was one-tenth of the current population. Uh, and of course, the cities have changed radically. There's nothing equal like 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Some cities have grown, some cities even have disappeared, but still the municipalities are there. But another interesting thing, 
the municipalities, they are uh, also electoral boundaries. There are electoral circumscriptions. And then one from, uh, if you as a government want to change in order to adapt the city governance to the reality, uh, you want to change the area of government in a city, you fight with the boundaries of the electoral system. And nobody wants to change the electoral systems because everybody is very uh, knowledge knowledgeable of how to manage their electoral systems. For example, the metropolitan area of Barcelona, it has 3,000 uh, square kilometers and it has a population of 5.5 million people. And uh, there are uh, something like 37 municipalities. There has been several, it has been several essays, several tries of creating a metropolitan government. It was a, a, a metropolitan government after the civil war. It was another essay of electro, a, a metropolitan government in the 70s. It has been an, a, another uh, uh, metropolitan government system in the 80s. And in fact, none of them truly works uh, because it's too complex. Politically, it's very difficult to put things up and to divide what is the electora electoral circumscriptions with the management units. And what happens at the end? It happens that the transportation system has one independent authority in order to manage the area of the transport system. The water system has its own system of management because the, mo the water catchment area is different. Then you, you find that for every specific aspect of uh, governments, you tend to create, due to the difficulty of creating a truly metropolitan government, you need to create different agencies that deals with the specifics. This is not the best way to govern a territory, to govern, you know, a space where people live. And uh, I think that this is, uh, is going to become uh, even an important uh, issue in the next decades, the next years, because cities are growing in the world. And cities are going farther their, uh, their frontiers, their boundaries. And therefore, there's going to be an increased pressure to invent new forms of metropolitanization in order to make that, uh, especially the issues of environmental uh, management, mm? the issues of transportation, solid waste collection, uh, you know, uh, uh, sunny, uh, uh, drainage, uh, these kind of things, which now with the climate change are becoming very, very crucial. Uh, even in New York, they, no, they cannot address this question. New York has five states uh, intervening in the government of New York, and in the metro, metro New York, there are 25 different uh, authorities which deal with different aspects of the governance. You have the port authority, which is sacred. You cannot touch the port authorities. The port authority has the bridges. The bridges to Manhattan is a system to control the traffic of Manhattan. Then you have the metro authority of, uh, London, of uh, New York, which is another uh, authority, etc., 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 and then you f you see everyday fights between the mayor, the government of the state, the governors of the other states, 
And it, when it was the Sandy Tem Tempest, the Sandy Tempest in, in New York, that New Jersey was flooded, apart from parts of Manhattan, then in the federal intervention to recover from the floodings, a new thing was needed to be invented because the floodings didn't follow the artificial uh, design of the authorities. Therefore, I think that in the 21st century, with the change that has happened in urbanization, rapid urbanization, a new chapter is going to be opened, and it's to talk about the scale of management of local issues in the land, in the place where people live. And this is just, we are seeing just the opening of this dossier, because this is going to become, I uh, advance, a very, very complex topic, uh, especially in front of the, uh, of the challenges of the climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks to everyone for introducing a lot of uh, complex topics, most recently total logistical nightmares. Uh, going back to Mr. Sean for a minute, I'd, I'd like to talk a bit about government's role in all of this. So Mr. Klaus in particular just raised a lot of questions about what, what system of government should be responsible to begin with. But in, in China, when a city or the country is considering a particular kind of idea, What's, what's the process for that? And in particular, there are a lot of questions about who decides, but the other question is, at what point are you able to incorporate public interest, public feedback? How do you consider that at the early phase of, of considering a new idea? Mm, okay. Uh, for the role of the government, uh, we uh, divided into two groups, government. It, one is the central government, one is the local government. For the central government, you know, uh, formerly, maybe 10 years ago, the central government set up different information systems that served for the central government. For example, the taxi, uh, tax, uh, tax uh, information system, the agriculture, uh, all are from the central government to the provincial uh, government to the uh, local uh, government. So uh, maybe 10 years ago, all the information systems are uh, top down, top down, that uh, carried out the, what the central government concerns for the uh, 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 national uh, national affairs. But for the uh, smart city, uh, uh, the emphasis is uh, we pay, po uh, pay uh, more attention for the uh, local government because they uh, take part in the construction of the smart cities, not the central government. And the central government, uh, we draw uh, some uh, uh, policies to guide, uh, to introduce how the local government, they should do that obey the central government's the policies, uh, the standards uh, are, are all um, drawn by the, by the central government. Uh, but uh, what the tasks are, are really done by the local governments. So the, lo the local governments, they, um, Every, uh, I visited many uh, Chinese cities. They take part in the, to draw the applying for the local governments uh, for the three years or five years, the smart city construction plan to let the society know, okay, this city, uh, they are prepared to build a smart city. And what's their emphasis uh, in the smart city? What's uh, the policies and what's their uh, Maybe the, the business models, uh, the government say it's okay for the uh, uh, enterprises, so they can for the, uh, to, uh, do much work for the digital economy, for the smart manufacturing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, but the, really the main, uh, the tasks are carried out by the companies, by the society. Uh, so uh, what the government do is just uh, give the uh, general plan, the micro planning for the smart city. Uh, but the projects are, are implemented by the different uh, ICT companies. They are the 
construction and uh, uh, operation, uh, uh, the role that, that they are taken uh, for the smart city. So you know in China, the government uh, maybe have more power than our uh, other countries. So in China, the speed uh, are very fast for the uh, smart city construction. And so, and I also invite uh, all the uh, guys, maybe you, maybe you have a chance to visit China to find more uh, uh, practices or pilot projects that are carried out in different uh, level of cities. So Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you. Mr. Close, you, you used to run a city yourself, as you started to allude to. Uh, and at UN Habitat, you also thought about how cities should be developing. What are cities not thinking about they, that they should be when they are considering instituting new smart cities, technologies? Well, I think that <coughs> uh, cities they are quite ready to, to, in general, to accept the new technology in, in mainly because new technology works. Then, as it, new technology works, there's no need to incentivate new technology. The market, in that sense, is going in favor of a, of a technology that it works. Huh? Uh, Perhaps what you see is that different rate of implementation of new technologies, but uh, the operators of new technology, they know that the city is a good place because there's a lot of people together. Uh, the investment in infrastructure, it's, uh, it yields uh, results because you serve more people. I don't think that uh, the ITC sector uh, has a problem with the uh, urbanization, just the contrary. If the government needs to subsidize something, is to reach ICT in the rural areas when there's no people. Uh, but in the city, the city is very embracing of uh, new technolo technologies in general. The question though is uh, how this embracement of new technology can help the city to become a more prosperous place. How to better use the, the technology uh, to increase the prosperity of, of the city. That's another question where the role of the local authority can play, a, 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 can play an important uh, uh, weight. Eh? Because if, if the local authority is ready to understand that uh, the local authority has some power to direct the ITCs to focus in the most productive aspects of the city, then we have a win-win situation. Uh, it's not just the market, the market goes very well, but also is including additionally some design, some intention, some priority. Now there's a fashion that every city wants to be a smart city, every city wants to be knowledge city, every city wants to be cultural city. Uh, you know, the music is there. Uh, the words are, are there. What is needed now is to take these concepts and manage them to achieve what you are looking for. Huh? Because, you know, that doesn't happen spontaneously. You need to manage to achieve a transformation of the city. You need to say no to somebody and you need to say yes to somebody else. And that is taking decisions. Huh? Uh, and this is a more complex thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would say that in that sense that a smart concepts is not something that you can just throw away to the citizens as if it's just an idea. Apart from that, you need to come after and to manage these processes in order that to achieve the, the, the values or, or the value, money, monetary value, 
that you can expect of a transformation of the city in that sense. Mala, this is something that uh, I know you and SAP have thought about this notion of how to tailor your services to what the goals of the city are, which is something that uh, Mr. Close is starting to, starting to talk about. Can you give an example of how you've worked with a city uh, to identify mutual goals and how important it is to understand what you're trying to achieve at the outset? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the context and the way we work with cities is we think about it by making sure that we're touching all elements from a stakeholder perspective particularly as we bring this notion of systems of intelligence into the entire data value chain. One, one good example I want to give is um, the city of uh, Antibes. And here, uh, the city of Antibes is a home to about 80,000 residents. And essentially, the provisioning of efficiency and safe and dependable clean water was extremely important. And so we rolled out the intelligent digital solution whereby through IoT sensors, we were able to really detect all factors that can influence the reliability of the clean and sustaining water. And, uh, and all of this, which, which resulted in the ability through the detection of all of these factors, the ability to proactively us to be able to disseminate you know, the safety of the water that reached all residents. So as a result of this, this drove high levels of precaution, high levels of efficiency, as we looked in, into you know, the benefits of being able to do this. The important element here were the three levers here, right? First is the ability for the city to partner with the entire ecosystem. And that becomes really important because there's so many different elements from utilities all the way to impacting the, f the factors of clean water and dependency. So the notion of a symphonic ecosystem to deliver this solution became really important. The second is to truly have the notion as we, that we created of this intelligent digital solution, right? As we look at embedding machine learning, big data analytics, IoT, these new forms of systems of intelligence, this enabled us to reap unprecedented value from this data that was aggregated that allowed us to proactively look at the deep learning abilities of all of these factors in the data value system and also being able to create new forms of innovation and new forms of business models. And the third, of course, is as we have the, the entire data value chain became available for the city to provide clean water, this allowed us to create new forms of innovation as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Anna, hello. Are you, are you getting my translation here? Yes. Yes, OK, excellent. Uh, muchas gracias. Eh, lo quiero decir que no, son, no somos niños de antes de ustedes, mas tenemos la voluntad de absorber aquí lo que es la experiencia de otra ciudad del mundo, mas fomos estableciendo algunas prioridades. Primeramente, ordenar, eh, crear aquí lo que es habitabilidad, porque tenemos en nuestra tierra mucha gente que no tiene acceso a la agua, a la energía, entonces tenemos que llevar esos servicios también. Eh, tener en cuenta el aspecto de movilidad en los transportes, a internet, crear planos de gestión de residuos sólidos, que es un problema en nuestro país también. Eh, de cierta forma, eh, tener el aspecto social, económico y ambiental conjugado, creando ciudades sustentables. Y muchas gracias por estar acá. Thank you. Alfonso, yeah. yes, uh, no, I, I've got a new question for oh, you. you were, Although you, you can answer that one as well, but I want to also have you speak a bit more to uh, how the private sector interacts in, in this process. So I'm almost starting to get at that, but I, I want you to kind of answer for me also what, what Ferrovial views its role as in terms of assuring the uh, common good, engaging with the public vis-a-vis -vis the government, how you view that role in your company and, and how you, you work toward that goal as well. So just to take, take your question from two sides, no? how first I'll get how we work with the governments and then how we involve the citizen on, on our solutions. Yeah. No? So first, um, I would like to say that the cities have been our natural environment for more than 50 years and the administration has been our, lo our 
natural client for even longer. No? So we are very used to work with them. And we work them with them in three phases, I would say, or three steps. No? Uh, first, on a strategic and planning phase, where we try to be innovative with them and co-create solutions with them. Then on a second stage is more the implementation phase that a good example could be now what we are doing for the bike sharing system here in Barcelona. That since we were awarded with the contract, we have had like almost weekly meetings with the city trying to make sure that when we start uh, our system and it coexists with existing, with existing one, we don't impact the city. city the citizens, we don't impact the city, and we don't impact the users of the system. So it's just working hand by hand, uh, trying to develop things together. And lastly, once we start uh, operating, what we do is purely uh, imply our operational excellence team. That is mainly trying to get technology and data analysis to be able to make our services more uh, smarter. And then the way we approach the citizen is, uh, I mean, for, us, for our company, it's part of our strategy. I mean, we have it very clear since, since a few years ago. And we, for that, we created uh, what we call the center of excellence for cities, which have different goals. No? But one of them is to understand what the user or the citizen wants and, and try to make our services more citizen ex uh, friendly. No? And the second goal of it is uh, being transversal to all the organization. So at the end, what we are doing is if we have a waste collection contract in Australia, we are trying to bring the best practices to Spain and the same way around no? and trying to see what things are being done good, done good there to bring them here. Uh, in the terms of how we listen to the citizen, we, we work in different stages again. Uh, we could go from a purely survey or just a quantitative to understand problems. Then we can go to more uh, dialogue or focus groups where we try to focus on solutions more than, than just the problem. And probably the third step is uh, our urban labs or experimentation labs where we involve the citizen, involve the city, involve the company, and try to come up with a solution uh, to a certain problem. We are doing this in Getxo at this moment, where we are trying to uh, make the citizen involved in the recycling process. And we are uh, gathering information and applying it to our service. Mm -hmm. uh, Alfonso, let me ask you first as a follow-up, and then I'll ask some others as well. How do you gauge success as to whether you have successfully incorporated those inputs when you go on to develop a product or to um, provide it to a particular city. How do you know whether uh, you've succeeded? Are you getting feedback at a later stage? Do you have other tools for thinking that through? For us, probably the, the big success is uh, at the end helping, helping the society to, with a social challenge. No? Uh, for example, uh, mobility or uh, waste collection at the end the real measure would be how many cars we are getting out of the street by applying a new technology or a new solution, or how many bottles are we avoiding on the ocean after applying it. And then on a more practical way, what we do is uh, surveys with our customers, surveys with the citizens, and just try to work from there and build uh, on it. Mola, well, do you want to weigh in on that as well? Yeah, so just building on what, um, what he said as well, I think if we look at um, uh, the, w when we apply these new forms of systems of intelligence, there are three things that that become possible, right? We can reap value from a lot of this data. We can unlock new business models and reimagine experiences. So the, the measures that we look for is, uh, first of all, the end measures to citizens, right? I mean, uh, how much has it really moved in terms of improving their lives and, and really touching them to actually gauge that, uh, that measure, it becomes really important. The second is the impact on productivity, right? What used to take, uh, you know, manual hours now, is there a next generation of automation that helps drive productivity to the next level? And I think the third very important one is when we think about next generation business models, the underlying concept behind these business models is being as proactive as possible. So what elements of the, of the services that are being provided that used to be reactive types of services are now proactive types of services. So a combination of productivity measures, a combination of driving increased you know, revenue impact, and then very importantly, citizen customer satisfaction would be the top line measures. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, Mr. Shen. Yeah. Let's talk about a, a different topic. So, so in China, you have a few entirely new neighborhoods, right? So uh, that are smart city neighborhoods. So one in particular, uh, in ba you're developing in Beijing with Alibaba as a smart city. I will, I will botch the name if I try to pronounce it, but it's twice the size of New York City, I understand, which is crazy. Is that accurate? Mm, uh, you mean the uh, uh, how about the the draw or the the the, the si physical size? Uh. In any event. Uh, it raises a lot of questions about what we're talking about here in particular because nobody's there yet, right? So how, how are you deciding, oh great, I've just gotten these questions which we'll get to in a moment. How are you deciding how you think about what the goals are there and how to satisfy the people who will be there at some point but aren't there now? Yeah, uh, it's very important for, the, uh, for us to get the information uh, from the public what they want uh, the city uh, to become uh, uh, really be, uh, what is smart? Because in Chinese, we uh, translate smart into wisdom. Wisdom, not just the smart. So uh, we have more meaning for smarter city. Uh, so uh, 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 in general, we, uh, uh, while the, uh, um, for example, the Alibaba system or the Texent uh, investiga investigation system to get a, uh, use a big data approach to get the local uh, information from the public, what they like the city to become in the future. Mm -hmm. So they, they may say we, have, uh, we want a better uh, transportation, a better environment, a better food supply, and a better uh, public services. So from the, in, uh, in this big data approach, we, the government, the central government, and the local government, uh, they can know what's the public concern uh, for the smart city. So they can uh, modern, uh, modify their macro plan of smart city and to adjustment, adjust their uh, implement, implementations of the smart city, uh, smart city projects to meet uh, the public, uh, the local uh, the, uh, fires, what they are concerned with uh, their uh, mm, what they uh, want the, the government to do for the smart city. And who are you getting feedback from, the residents of Beijing, or, or where, who? Uh, you, you mean? Uh, wh which citizens? citizens? Any people who live in Yeah, we, we maybe uh, we use uh, uh, in internet uh, approaches that they meet, meet maybe uh, every ordinary people in the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, we have two questions from the audience here, which uh, I, we can get to briefly, I think, or at least one of them. The fir they're both anonymous. The first one asks, uh, how can innovative governance models contribute not only to city development, but sustainable tourism development that goes with it in urban areas? Uh, Mr. Klaus, you want uh, How the? How can innovative governance models, here, you can read it yourself, actually, if you'd like. Sustainable tourism development. Ah, tourism. Mm. Big key question. That could be a goal, too. <laughs> a goal. Tourism. Yeah, well, there's a lot of controversy now about tourism. Eh? Some cities, they are complaining of too much tourism, and etc. including Barcelona, by the way. Uh, well, tourism, by the way, let's begin. Tourism is, is growing in the world. Uh, and it's going to grow even more. As more people in the world access to middle classes uh, in China, India, everywhere, uh, it's going to be more tourism, not less, eh? more. And uh, tourism uh, is good because it's culture, it's uh, knowing about the world, uh, you know, tourism is something that it's a positive business. Eh? Uh, and for many poor countries that they have a lot of natural capital in form of a scenarios or whatever, tourism is a possibility for development. Then tourists, it's here to stay and grow. Therefore, if it's here to stay and grow, uh, we, met, we better manage it. We, we better don't forbid it, okay? We cannot put 
doors to uh, a, 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 an international movement that it comes with modern society. The, the, as we move from industrial society, manufacturing society, to knowledge society, tourism is bound to grow even more. Okay? And it's going to become a very important economic sector in the overall economy of every country. Therefore, we better anticipate the problems or the issues in order to manage something that is not a liability, is an asset. Then, when it presents some issues, some problems, we better address and manage those problems. Uh, you know, problems of congestion or problems of too much overcrowding or whatever. But uh, without killing the business of tourism. Eh? The business of tourism, it's a positive, it generates jobs, it, it improves culture of the people, it's something positive. And then what we need to take care is the, side, the unwanted side effects. And to take care of that one, <laughs> unwanted side effects, you know, every case needs to study its problem. Eh? If you have a, a, a big city with just a very small area of cultural interest, you better create more areas of cultural interest in the city. I don't know. This is for the city manager to find out how to address the problem. But understanding that the, for the future of our modern contemporary uh, economy, tourism as a sector of the economy is going to, to grow, hopefully. If not, something wrong would be happening in the world. I prefer that the tourism advances than the Third World War. Eh? Uh, just to put, hmm? then let's look at tourism as something positive for the planet and let's manage the unwanted consequences or, or the unwanted uh, externalities in economic terms of uh, too much tourism. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that one? We have another one, so it's very general, uh, but good. Which common good might both companies and citizens have? So do they have, I guess, a, a unified common good? Can they lead towards cooperation? That's maybe a different but related question, but both important ones. Have, have, have any of you guys identified a, a common good that is shared between companies and the general public on which it's not so much attention as a, as a shared goal? Yes, you're the only one with your hand up, so go ahead. Employment. Employment, yes, yes. The big, the big uh, challenge of our future society is employment. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we need to create a new alliance between the private and the s public sector in order to think about uh, which are going to be the future forms of employment. Yeah, absolutely. Because I don't know how to manage a population without employment. I'd agree. I think employment for sure. And um, I think the other one I would say is sustainability. Mm -hmm. I think this is definitely a common purpose across suppliers, across consumers, and across providers as well. And I think the, the benefits of having sustainability targets, you know, impacts both public sector, private sector, and citizens as well. So I, th I think this is something that we really need to look at across the ecosystem for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the second part of this question, can they lean towards cooperation, gets at uh, that what you were talking about earlier of this 
private sector moving faster than government sometimes and how to, how to account for that. What, have, has anybody had a good positive experience with cooperation to end on? An example of when it goes well? Private. Between private sector and the government in implementing a, a new, new technology or innovation. Yeah, uh, you know we've we've had a lot of uh, a lot of cooperation that happens across across both for sure. Particularly when we look at uh, any of these uh, you know these initiatives that are driven for purpose for common good. Uh, when we look at being able to achieve uh, whether it's sustainability targets or the impact of climate change, um, certainly there is a tight cooperation here because and the the underlying principle of the tight cooperation is that when you look at this ecosystem of providers, of suppliers, as well as consumers, and you look at the data value chain across this, there needs to be that tight synergy across both to be able to achieve those targets for sure. Yep, absolutely. Uh, well, thank you all. I think we can conclude it there. Uh, it's been really wonderful to talk about these, these issues with you all, and, but I think we've left open a lot of consideration for the rest of the conference actually about what it means to achieve uh, the common good in, in instituting new technologies and, and what we need to think about there. Thank you.